Welcome to Worldwide Bible Study. Genesis 25, verses 29 and 30, Life of Jacob with uh, Luther. God be praised. Uh, I'm Pastor Wolf Mueller. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we might embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of eternal life, which you've given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Uh, we are working on the text here from uh, Genesis 25. should be able to see the screen there. Uh, Genesis 25, verses 29 and 30, once when Jacob was cooking stew. Now, just as a reminder for what we've been, uh, what we've got beforehand, uh, we remember that it was talking about how Jacob was in the tents and Esau was a man of the field. And we saw Luther's take on that, that the fence meant that, that Jacob was paying attention to the scriptures and to the, um, as well as to the church that he was engaged in those two estates while Esau was really engaged in politics as well as hunting and warfare and all of that. And while we would normally say, well, that means that Jacob is the wimpy one and Esau is the manly one, uh, Luther's going to say, hey, Esau is the one who's concerned with the world, and Jacob is the one who's concerned about the kingdom of God. Well, we're going to, yeah, that's Luther's take, and you're free to disagree with that. It goes against our modern sensibilities, which is actually why this is helpful, because it lets us rethink this. And so we're going to see the fruit of their divergences. In other words, they're going to show up and look very different now. They're going to act very different. So one day, Jacob was cooking stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was exhausted, famished. I did a, the word here is um, ayach, tired, exhausted. You see how it's translated? It's used 17 times uh, in the Old Testament. Exhausted, faint, parched, thirsty, weary. Oh, that does, flips it. So that's there. So you see down here, exhausted. Jacob was cooking. He's exhausted. Gideon came to Jordan, crossed over. He and the 300 men were with him, exhausted. So this is a kind of the result of this long work. Uh, the, another one, we're faint. Deuteronomy 25, you were faint and weary and cut off your tail, those who were lagging behind you and did not fear God. Isaiah 29, uh, when the hungry man dreams, behold, he's eating, awakes with hunger, not satisfied. There's when a thirsty man dreams, and behold, he's drinking, awakes faint, thirsty, his thirst not quenched. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul thirsts for you like a parched land. So this is a word of uh, like desperate hunger. And so Esau comes in to the house, and he is, he's got that hunger there. Uh, and he says to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am parched, exhausted. Therefore, his name was called Edom, which is like the word for red. So um, I wonder if I can, uh, I, wonder, I wonder how to pull that Hebrew up. Let's see. So uh, Edom and is the word here. Let me eat some of that. Uh, it's a play on words. Here, here it is. So that red stew, let me eat some of that red stuff, he says, and that's why his nickname becomes Edom, and he becomes the father of the Edomites. So you see, that's it's a a play on words. Okay. So, uh, so here's how Luther translates it. Once when Jacob was boiling pottage, Esau came in from the field and was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that pottage, that red pottage, for I am famished. Therefore, his name is called Edom. He has red hair. He wants the red stew. Pottage. I, don't, I, I, I think stew is good. I think that's right. Red meat stew. Now, up to this point, so let's see what, how Luther goes on about this. Uh, up to this point, um, Moses had described the divergent pursuits of the two brothers that the two brothers had. Esau was man of a field and a hunter. That is, he concerned himself little about the pursuits of godliness, the sermons and teachings of the fathers who were still living. 
What usually happens to everybody happened to him. When people are indifferent about small things, they gradually lose the greater things too. So this is a matter of uh, not going to church. Oh, let's see. Red meat stew. Someone says, someone says lentils. I wonder if, um, if we'll get some, if there's someone pottage stew, thick stew, cooking stew, some stew, stew. That's what it was. So, so, um, uh, the small things, for neglecting our prayers, not going to church, uh, missing our devotions or whatever. And then the, the, the other things start to go missing as well. Earlier uh, in the text, Luther had talked about this verse from, uh, from Jesus, which is so helpful, where he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. But if you seek all these other things, you lose them and you lose the kingdom of God. So, so that um, so, uh, it's, it's um, Jesus was talking about this in, uh, in the gospel reading from, from Sunday in Denmark, uh, which was, uh, which was, is it not going to give me another copy of the Bible, which was um, John chapter 12 where he says, those who love their lives will lose it. And those who hate their lives for my sake will find it. So that, um, uh, let me just pull it up here. Uh, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He, and so this is Jesus talking about himself and his own passion. But then he who loves his life will lose it. So if you want to keep your life, you can't. If, you, if you're trying to hold on to your life, get, gain all the things of this life, poof, it's gone. But if you hate your life in this world, you keep it for eternal life. So that, so that investing, this is a funny, concerning ourselves with the kingdom of God, not only means that the Lord will add to us his life and peace, but then everything else is added as well, according to the Lord's will. What is this verse in the Psalms that says... Um, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Somebody knows what verse that is. Psalm 41 or something. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. And the reason is because Psalm 37, 5. Thanks, Pastor Gernander. Uh, when we delight in the Lord, then what do we want? What's, if we delight in the Lord, what's the desire of our heart? The Lord himself. And he gives himself to us. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So we say, Lord, I delight in you. And he says, here I am. It's great. Okay. Okay. So uh, up to this point, Moses had uh, anyways, you indifferent about the small things. You gradually lose greater things too. Esau considered it as a small and unimportant matter that he would... Uh, that he was more indifferent in the pursuits of godliness than Jacob was. He did not glow with zeal for the divine services and the knowledge of worship of God as Jacob did. But that indifference gradually grows and progresses to the point where he even despises his birthright. Next, he falls into smugness and arrogance, which cause him to think he can deceive his brother with impunity, as though he had not sold his birthright in earnest. That's what happens next. So he's going to sell his birthright for a pot of stew, and then he's going to act like he didn't. Uh, for he did not believe that the birthright could be transferred to his brother. He believed that it belonged rightfully to him. He hopes that things he, he will keep the blessing. He makes sport of his brother, thus becomes completely ungodly in, in his relation uh, to God, to his fellow man, and to his brother. He makes it so that, so that uh, the idea here is that Jacob, uh, that Esau says, yeah, I'll sell you my birthright, but it's, you know, he's got his fingers crossed. He doesn't think it's a serious thing. Whatever. Just give me some stew. You can't take this from me. It belongs to me. So forth. Now, uh, this, there's one thing before we move on to the Luther's um, comment. And I want to think about this little text here. Um, he becomes completely ungodly in his relation to God, to his fellow man, 
and to his family, to his brother. And these three things got me thinking of, uh, well, this passage that I was reading in Luthart about the stages of sin. It's a little bit different here in Luther, but Luthart, I'll show you the passage. He talks about how sin is a, there's a pattern to sin in the fall, and there's kind of three, three disjunctions that happen when we sin. So let me flip over here. So this is, um, you got I think you have to be careful with Luthart, uh, Christopher Ernst Luthart, uh, Apologetic Lectures on the Saving Truths of Christianity. Uh, Jordan Cooper published this book, 1872. Um, it was written and was copied into English really quickly from German. And it's curious that he was a favorite of the English. And, um, I keep wondering that there I've seen some things come up in uh, just in the last couple of months from C.S. Lewis that are reflected from Luthart, and it's really interesting. So so let's just I want to look at this paragraph here that talks about the three breaks that happen with sin. Uh, and mostly it's not because they're exactly the same, but it's just because it reminded me and I thought it was helpful. Um, so uh, the sinful act here, the sinful act of the first created human beings went through three stages. The first was disbelief of God's love. The prohibition enjoined then seemed to them an arbitrary denial of a desirable good and an obstacle to their freedom instead of an assistance on the road thereto. Do you see what? So, so that Adam and Eve doubted that God loved them and was providing for them and rather thought that God was against them. With this, with faith in God, moreover, love to him also disappeared. So, so they doubted God's promise. They lost their faith. And then they then lose their love for God. And the tendency of their heart toward God was first checked and then turned into a contrary direction. That was the first stage. Man then put himself in the place of God. You will be like God and so forth. So the first break, let me just highlight this here. The first break here is with God, and then the second break is with humanity or even with self. Man put himself in the place of God. He took his lot into his own hand and purposed in his arrogant self-exaltation to look for the future to his own powers for happiness. He can do it himself. He desired, as if he had been his own creator, to be what he wished to be through himself alone. He forgot that God was his origin and therefore his end and made himself in his proud, uh, let me do this like this, in his proud self seeking, the end and aim of his life. And to this, the second was added the third stage, that of sensuous gratification in the world of which he becomes the slave instead of the king. Now, this is an amazing thing, is that when we're driven by our own passions and desires, we become slaves to, the, to creation. He became a slave instead of a king. Unbelief, pride, and sensuous pleasure. So those are the three stages of sin. Unbelief, pride, and sensuous pleasure. The threefold, threefold perversion of man's threefold relation to God to himself, and to the world. And this threefold dissolution of his original harmony upon which depended his holiness, his life, and his happiness. His holiness, that's God himself, that's his life and family, and his happiness, this life in the world. It is in these three fundamental forms that sin first appears, and that we still meet it in the history of the human mind. These are the three great historical forms of rationalism, pantheism, and materialism. Rationalism, reason instead of faith, pantheism, uh, pride over um, that we are gods, and materialism that we're, the world is for our own pleasure. It's kind of amazing, actually. So that I, I think this, is, this passage here in Ludhard is really quite helpful to reflect on. And you see that these broken things between God first, so over here with Esau, God and his fellow man, and even his own family, his brother, that all these things are broken uh, by the fall. 
Okay. Let me check in the chat. Some stuff is happening over here. Oh, the pastors are preaching. Let's see what they're saying. Ah, that's nice. Pastor uh, uh, Nauman, especially with this, uh, the lentils versus the meat. And then, uh, yes, yes, that's right. And then uh, Pastor Gernander uh, talks about the gradualness that Luther puts there. Uh, this is a really interesting thing, is that you don't become a pagan overnight. You, it, you know, it takes 40 days from Moses up on the mountain. And, uh, and that paganism is kind of growing. And we're, we're all on the way. It's really quite interesting uh, how, you know, we have, there's, there's sort of trend lines in our own hearts and our own lives. Okay. Now here, so back to Luther. Uh, so such, uh, such ungodliness and smugness follows when the word of God is despised and is not made use of. So the key here is the is the word of God. It's it um uh not made you so that we use the word of God. We exercise ourselves in the word of God. People become atheist, no God, epicurean, desiring pleasure, bereft of reason, irrational, and so forth. The examples of even very excellent people prove this. David, King David, was a very saintly man, most ardent in his worship of God. But how quickly he was driven to adultery, murder, and blasphemy. To be asleep with regard to the word of God is to open the window to the devil. Someone want to quote that on Twitter? I'll do it later. But this is a, to be asleep with regard to the word of God is to open the window to the devil. Therefore, we have the command to be watchful, as it's written in 1 Peter 5, 8 which says, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, pours, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour, someone to devour. Ephesians 5, 15, he says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of the time. Sluggishness and indifference uh, in, doc, in sacred matters have often resulted in the greatest lapses and in horrible sins. What is really interesting to me is that it seems like the third commandment and the sixth commandment are the commandments that are we are pressed on the hardest to neglect the divine service, to neglect church, to neglect the word of God, and then um, indulgence in the desires of the flesh. This idea of sluggishness here, I wonder, it'd be really interesting to know what word Luther uses for sluggishness, because uh, a lot of times we have this discussed as in the, in the, with the language of acadia or acedia, which is, some, which is the, one of the seven deadly sins of sloth. And it's very wonderful that, that Luther will recognize that that sloth really comes in not with work. I mean, it does come in with work, but most especially with the word of God. In fact, it, this is my diagnosis of one of the biggest problems that we face. And that is that, that we are tempted to be bored, that the devil tempts us to boredom. And he tempts us to boredom in our, our vocations. But especially he tempts Christians to be bored with the word of God, to be bored with the catechism, pastors to be bored with the doctrine the confessions and the scriptures. I don't know how many times I've seen when husbands and wives come in and they've got problems. And the problem is that they're bored with each other or one is bored with the other. And then, but so they, someone else is not bored with them. And oof, that, that someone not being bored with you is a, is a powerful sort of thing. So one, one of the most important things is that we're able to listen. And that, and that is also true then spiritually for the word of God, that we're able to give our attention to the scriptures. We're able to give our attention to God's word. We're able to, to savor it. Um, it's not just letting our eyes pass over the, it, over the words. It's, this, it's a taste. I wonder if we can find that. Luther talks about this. Um, acedia in connection to the third commandment in the large catechism. I, I'm kind of interested in that. Do you guys mind if I just, I hadn't thought about this before, but uh, the large catechism, third commandment. 
Uh, and I wonder if I can search for that. Uh, like this, find. How do you spell Acadia? Acadia, sloth. No. Uh, boredom. He quotes it in, in my version that I study. He quotes it in the Greek, actually. Well, let's just read a few here. This is where uh, indeed the Christian should make every day a holy day and give ourselves to holy activities. Occupy that is occupy ourselves daily with God's word and carry it on our hearts and our lips. However, as we have said, since all people do not have this much time or leisure, we set apart several hours a week for the young, a day for the whole community, when we can concentrate on such matters and deal especially with the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer. That, by the way, is what Luther understands to be the Catechism, the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, those three texts. Thus, we may regulate our whole lives and being according to God's Word. Wherever this practice is enforced, the Holy Day is truly kept. Where it's not, the Holy Day can't be called a Holy Day. Non-Christians can spend a day in rest and idleness, too. And so can the whole swarm of clerics in our day who stand daily in the churches singing and ringing bells without sanctifying the holy day because they neither preach nor uh, oops, where did I move it? Nor practice God's word, but teach and live contrary to it. The word of God is the true holy things above all holy things. This is an, actually an amazing passage here uh, where he... Um, uh, where Luther is talking about the, the word for holy thing here is relic. Uh, I wonder if that's what that footnote says. The, uh, highly getum, the word for relic. Uh, to understand Luther's meaning, read something like this. We used to be taught to revere relics and other holy things, but God's word is the true relic. In other words, God's word is the thing that makes other things holy. In the medieval church, the relics would come and sanctify you. And Luther says, no. The, the one relic, the one thing that sanctifies that we have is the word of God. Pastor Gernander's pushing me to verse, to paragraph 99. Let's see here. Aha, there it is. Acedia. Uh, in the same way, those conceited fellows should be chastised who, after hearing a sermon or two, become sick and tired of it and feel that they know all and need no more instruction. This is precisely the sin that used to be classed among the mortal sins and was called acedia sloth, acadia, acidia, that is indolence, indolence or satiety, a malignant, pernicious plague with which the devil bewitches and befuddles the hearts of many so that he may take us by surprise and stealthily take the word of God from us. And here is the, here is the, the thing that happens is that we become, uh, mm, we become in we it's not like we uh it's not it's not like we 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 lose our confession like if someone came up to us and they said hey do you believe in god we say oh yeah i believe in god and they said do you believe the bible is god's word we say oh yeah i believe the bible is god's word. do you believe the bible is true yeah yeah i believe it's true inerrant infallible efficacious sufficient i believe i i believe that all those things are true about the bible but also it's been like 3 weeks since i opened it how could you believe all those things about the Bible and not and not study it? This is the point, is that the devil, he doesn't tempt us to say, oh, the Bible's wrong. Now we're like the atheists that have the YouTube channels sitting there calling Christians fools or whatever. But he draws our attention away from the words of God. He draws our affection away from the words of God. How much, how much of our lives are a battle for right affections, or maybe to say it, to, to, to a desire for, a, a battle for right desire. We normally talk about hmm, the will as so important. We think our will is, but it's our, it's, it's, there's, it's so important to think about our wants. What do I want? What do I desire? This is why when Luther teaches the, the small catechism to the kids, he says that the third commandment means we should fear and love God so that we don't despise preaching in his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. That, that gladness is spiritual warfare. D 
Delight is spiritual warfare. And the devil is busy. He, he, doesn't, um, he doesn't have to make you husbands hate your wives. Just be bored with them. And wives for your husbands. And parents for your children. And children for your parents. And you workers for your work. He just steals away your gladness. Did you see the subtlety here? So this Akadia, it's a mortal sin. I'm bored with the word of God, etc. And this is what the, uh, Luther's contention is, what happens with Esau. He's bored with the word of God. After all, he's got hunting to do. He's got a, you know, he's inventing weapons. He's going out there. He's, he's working hard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Bill says, what if worshiping the Bible, not Christ, what does that look like? That looks like Phariseeism. I'll, let me look at you guys in the face so I can tell. So remember Jesus says in John 5, you search the scriptures thinking that in them you have, have life. You don't see that they testify of me. So that our love for the scriptures grows out of our love for Christ and vice versa. They're feeding off of one another. So that the Bible is what brings Christ to us. This is his gift to us. And if we're reading the Bible because... Um, then we can be right while everybody is wrong, then uh, we're abusing the text. But I think that's right. This affection for the scriptures comes to us because, because, uh, because here in the scriptures, nobody, we, we hear the things from God that we can't hear anywhere else. We can't hear it in our own hearts. We can't hear it in the world. We can't hear it from... It's only here where Jesus comes and says, I love you. I delight in you. You're my bride. So great. Okay. Uh, even in, Luther continues, in worldly matters, in worldly matters, uh, it's the utmost importance to be vigilant, to pay heed, or to neglect an opportunity. Thus, the Turks watch carefully for all opportunities. They have won so many victories over us in a short time. In 1532, our emperor had an opportunity near Vienna to be brilliantly successful against the Turk, but since he neglected it, we're now looking in vain for other opportunities. This is Luther paying attention to the geopolitics. Let us accustom ourselves to wholehearted love for the first table. This is the love for God, God's word, worship. First commandment, second commandment, third commandment. First, that's the first table. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. If it's necessary to take to the field or to assume some other responsibility in the household or in the government, the kingdom of God should be our first and foremost concern. So we got to go do the other works of our vocation, but first of all, God. If this is disregarded, we see Esau fall. Uh, we see Esau falling so wretchedly, he never rises again. Jacob, on the other hand, prospers and becomes the firstborn because of a very favorable opportunity. Esau has the name and the glory of being the firstborn, but meanwhile, he falls suddenly and horribly and is deprived of all the glory and honor. Therefore, do not sleep. Be very attentive to all opportunities, lest you lose your gifts in the kingdom of God because of your negligence. Uh, to be, how does Paul say it? Be ready in season and out of season. Or Peter says, always be ready to give uh, explanation for the hope that is in you with gentleness and with respect. Boy, is that a passage. Always be ready to give a defense. I, I, I want to look at that. I'm, what time is it? Oh, we got time. Where is that? First Peter, is it chapter three? Always be ready. It's right after the baptism passage. Um, oh, I thought it was right here. Uh, someone know the... Uh, Someone know the passage, always be ready to give a defense. Is it First Peter 2? It's right here somewhere. I'm just moving too fast. 315. I was right there in the neighborhood. I just missed it. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. This is it's to sanctify means to, um, to consider holy. That, that's the third commandment explanation of the catechism. Ah. Uh, we consider it holy. The Lord, the Lord, we, there's, a, there's a courtroom in our own conscience. There's a seat. There's a throne. The, the evangelicals used to talk like this. There's a throne room 
in there's a throne room in your heart and who sits on the throne and that is actually helpful language who sits on that throne and you know who sits on that throne when you ask who do i love most of all what do i trust most of all who what am i most afraid of that's whatever that is that's what's sitting on that throne and here it says it should be the lord god jesus in your hearts and always be uh ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for the reason now this is our this is our um uh, apologetics text that we always use and i think it's uh I, I think it's good. It's a it's a beautiful text, but I think what's really interesting is that this is the part that we read. It says, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason. But what we often miss is then what comes next for hope that is in you. And how? With meekness and fear. So that uh so that we have we're defending our hope. We often think that we have to defend our faith. But what is most troublesome to the world is, well, I think our faith is troublesome to the world, but even more troublesome than our faith is, the, is our hope. And that we're doing it with meekness and with fear. Is that Phobos? Yep. With, 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 uh, with patience, with long-suffering, with, with humility, and with fear. When, we, when we're having these conversations, there's a danger that we meddle up our consciences. So we want to have a good conscience. And by our good conduct, that those who revile us might be ashamed. So that there's a, there's a way that we come and, and um, give a defense specifically for the hope that's in us. Abil says, I'm not sure if Luther was always respectful of his opponents. Sometimes he was blunt in the extreme. He was. He always, and it's interesting to see, Luther at times will, ref, will reflect on his own sort of personality. Uh, I don't know if he liked that about himself. You know, in fact, in the Diet of Worms, we were talking about the Diet of Worms yesterday. Diet of Worms sounds gross. Not yesterday. We were talking about the Diet of Worms an hour ago. And, um, and there Luther says, sometimes I've written too harshly. And for this, I'm sorry. But, oh, well. Uh, we, we, good thing we don't follow Luther. We follow Jesus. Therefore, do not sleep. Be very attentive. But back to Luther. Ha! <laughs> Ironically. But uh, uh, we do not sleep, but are very, very attentive to opportunities, especially we're looking for opportunity for the word of God. To embrace the word of God. To, to have the word of God, to, re, to study the word of God, to perpetuate the word of God. This reason scripture has set the example before us, not as a cold and a dead story, but for our instruction and to remind us the state of affairs and persons exist in all ages. The Holy Spirit wants to keep those two brothers before our eyes continually and consider them as a daily proverb. For at all times, we are either Esauris. How do you think you say that word? Esau-ires, 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 Esau-ites, or Jacobites. In outward appearance, Esau is saintlier, more religious than all the others, and seems to be the owner and heir of the kingdom of heaven. Yet he's nothing else than Esau, that is, self-righteous, works righteous, a hypocrite who is not seriously concerned about religion. He is religious solely for the sake of gain and his belly. Their God is their belly. Nor can the name church be taken away from him, just as we do not have the name church before the world, but are regarded as heretics and as born second. But the papists boast that they are the firstborn. They are Esauaries. <laughs> Even if we were to prevail over the Pope and his followers to, the, uh, to achieve success with a doctrine which characterizes the true church, there would arise among us either papists or Turks who would arrogate to themselves the title church, just as the Anabaptists and Sacramentarians do, etc. They've already appeared. It cannot happen otherwise. Thus the Arians arose when the heathen persecutions had been overcome. They usurped the name church, and the true church was despised and spurned. Thus at all times, Cain or Abel, 
Esau or Jacob certainly originate from the same stock, from the same st- um, from the same gospel of salvation. So that both Cain and Abel are born of Adam and Eve. Both Esau and Jacob are born of Rachel and Isaac. There's always true brothers. And one is going to be is going to be haughty and lifted up, and the other is going to be humble and weak. And the one is going to look like it has success, and the other is not. There's always going to be the true and false church. Someone, you know, there's this famous Luther quote that says that wherever the Lord builds a church, the devil builds a chapel. I do not know where that is. I've looked for it, but I found a quote where Luther says, wherever the Lord builds a church, the devil builds a tavern. (laughs) But this is the history of the world. It's really interesting, by the way, um, this idea that the Arians arose when the heathen persecutions had been overcome, that there's, uh, and there's a handful of places where our Lutheran fathers the, the, those theologians, they read history, early church history in this way, is that you had first the age of the martyrs and then the age of the heretics, and then the Middle Ages, which is the age of indifference. And it's um, it's like uh, three phases of spiritual warfare. And the first phase of spiritual warfare was the, the sword, where the... the um, the emperors, you know, the proconsuls, and everyone would say, "Hey, if you confess Christ, we're going to kill you." And uh, uh, that was bad. But the church did fine. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The church grew and was great. So then comes the attack of the heretics, and so you have the Arian heresy, and you have all the disputes over over um, the Trinity, over the two natures of Christ, over the Scriptures, over salvation, etc. But the church survived that and confesses the faith and has the creeds. So then the Lutheran guy said, we're in the third phase of spiritual warfare, which is the time of indifference. It's the time of, you know, people not caring about God's word. I think we're probably still in the time of indifference. So Esau is the bishop, the factotum, the church. I don't know what that word factotum means. Uh, there should be a way for me to look it up in a dictionary, right? Factotum. I, I don't want to know where Luther uses it. Someone better just tell me. Uh, yet nothing is owed to him, for by divine authority, the entire blessing has been transferred to Jacob, who's the true possessor of all honors. And uh, uh, and of the kingdom of heaven. But so far as he's been deprived of the name and the prestige owed to him by his brother Esau, himself provides a wonderful opportunity to acquire it, an opportunity that surpasses Jacob's every hope and thought. One cannot get away from the pottage. Um, (laughs) This intention to deceive his brother does not enter Jacob's mind, but everything happens in accordance with the arrangement and plan of God, contrary to the attention of the two, Jacob and Esau. Jacob is attending to his usual tasks. He's in the tent with his mother, Rebecca. He's cooking pottage. This simple matter, God turns into a wonderful opportunity. Esau returns from the field. The exertion and activity of hunting, a pursuit which pleased his father Isaac, have made him tired. And it is apparent that he did not bring along anything to eat because he's not only fatigued, but hungry and thirsty. This is why he asked so eagerly for some of that red pottage. He employs a repetition. Let me eat some of the red pottage. That red pottage. Uh, that was in the in the text where uh, the text is over here. Uh, let me eat some of that red stew. I'm exhausted. It comes up twice. I wonder why we don't have it in the Hebrew. I mean, in the uh, English. Uh, give me some of that. Uh, give me some of that stew. That stew, he says. <laughs> this indicates great appetite, a desire for food, as if some famished person would say, let me eat uh, with you of that carp and of just that carp for which I have a desire. Moses wants to indicate not only the hunger and weariness of Esau, but also his pleasure and appetite, namely that he looked and longed for that red pottage with extraordinary pleasure. Uh, I commend this passage to Hebrew grammarians for more careful explanation, for it's impossible to translate any language in such a way that all the emphasis and forms and all the words and sentences are preserved. The verb Esau uses in speaking to Jacob is this word here, hal atsani. It occurs in this passage only, but what its meaning is, neither the Jews nor I know. Um, 
this is it's interesting to see how in this time uh in this time it's uh hebrew was was not well used in the church uh they, they in fact the greek was even not that used but especially hebrew but the the catholic church had the latin vulgate but even the early church probably late early and early medieval church considered the septuagint to be the right translation of the old testament and so there's kind of a long history of neglecting the hebrew work until until really luther makes a big change in the in the academic work of hebrew but that's maybe for another time but you see him wrestling with these words here the con the conjugation the construction reveal the meaning to some extent i beg you let me eat feed me give me to eat it's not without reason that Holy Scripture wanted to speak of in this particular way. It could have used another expression to denote feeding, nourishing, something of that kind. It wanted to use a special verb. Rabbi Solomon, and this is not King Solomon, but imagines that Esau was so tired that he was unable to raise his hand to his mouth and put the food into himself. I don't know whether this agrees properly with what follows when the text says he ate and drank and went his way. But to this, to, but the meaning is that Esau wanted the pottage which Jacob had cooked for himself to be given to him. He said, feed or refresh me with that red pottage. That the words, therefore, his name is called Edom are added, uh, is not at all without purpose, although the reason for the name, namely the lentils or the red pottage, hey, lentils, Luther says, seems rather ridiculous and senseless. Undoubtedly, however, something more important is hinted at. When Esau was born completely red, he was not called red, Edom, because of his red skin, which would be a weightier and more justifiable reason for the surname. But there his name is called Edom, or sorry, Esau. Now, when he had his fill of red pottage, he's called Edom. But Esau has three names. Esau is his own name, which he received at birth through his circumcision. His surname is Edom from the red pottage, nickname, last name. The third name is Seir. Above these, I don't know about this. Above these two names, Edom and Seir are combined. Yet he is called Esau. Furthermore, he got the name Seir either from the mountains on which he lived, previously it was called Seir, from his shagginess because he was red and hairy. Perhaps even the region occupied was rough and wild. Hence, the Idumean nation is called the nation of Seir from Esau, who occupied Mount Seir because he had that land, Seirim, the land, and he lived there. Fawns and shaggy saunters, wild, hairy men. Fawns, huh? I wonder if that's deer for hunting. The wild region. I'm not sure whether such fawns and saunters lived in the region elsewhere in the Bible. The sa'irim are taken to be demons who appear in the form of fawns. Wow. I, I don't, I, I remember reading this a few weeks ago, but I, I do not remember tracking this down. So anyway, so he, so we have the three names of Esau. Now we're going to get to verse 31. How are we doing on time? Oh, 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, let's look at the text here. So this will take us to the end of the chapter. Jacob said, uh, so Esau says, give me some of that food. And Jacob says, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now we should note here that we are tempted to see the scoundrel in this story as Jacob. But Moses helps us and says, the guilt is with Esau, who despised his birthright. In fact, Esau had claimed a birthright that belonged to Jacob in the first place. And then Jacob now sees this opportunity, which he could have never seen. You know, when he started cooking <laughs> the stew, he could have never imagined that that stew will be the way that the Lord would restore the birthright to him. But now here comes Esau, and it, and it happens like this. I, uh, maybe I'll tell you a story, and then we'll end there, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start here next week with, uh, with Luther's uh, comment on this. Um, one of the temptations that we always have 
let me just talk for, about myself here. One of the temptations that I always have is to think that I've got to solve every problem myself. So can you imagine um, Jacob trying to think that I've got to make this thing right? Here Esau is claiming the, the promise which was given for me. So how do I how do I hand, how do I fix it? How do I do it? But a lot of times there's no there's no solution in ourselves. And so what's the what is there to do except for to pray and wait on the Lord? And the Lord um, answers our prayer and and blesses us in ways that we could never imagine. He he gets he 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 always can he he can open doors in the walls that we didn't even know were there uh and he blesses us in that way and takes care of us now so the lord will always put us it's like remember the biblical picture is the uh the israelites in the wilderness when there's a mountain on the east um, oh, sorry a mountain on the south a mountain on the north the red sea on the east and an egyptian army on the west and they're stuck and the lord put them there where they were stuck so that then they pray and the lord builds a a way through the red sea that the lord loves to do this because then and i think the reason is i i don't know the mind of the lord but i if i were to guess the reason why the loves the lord loves to do this so much is because he wants us to know that he's the one who's rescuing us and he's the one that is delivering us I'll tell you a story about this when we stop recording. Um, that's a really kind of an amazing thing when this was confirmed for me, but this has been confirmed over and over and over. So the Lord puts us in a place where we're stuck. So then what do we do? We pray. And then he delivers us in such a way that we could never have asked for it or imagined it. Well, let's stop there and then uh, we'll say a, a prayer and then we'll we'll click off the recording and then we'll be uh, we'll we'll be uh, after a, a chat and conversation here. If you're watching this, by the way, this recording later, uh, join us on Wednesday mornings. The conversation that comes afterwards is great, so you can join us live for that. Let's uh, let's end with a prayer. Oh Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers and you deliver us and you answer us, and that you are an ever present help in all times of trouble. Uh, bless and keep us in your word. Uh, rescue us from spiritual sloth. Give us a joy and a delight in you and your word and your kindness. Uh, and in this joy, protect us from the devil. Be our gladness now and always through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Don't forget to go to your pastor's Bible study this Sunday.